Hi, EGP learners. Welcome to another episode of the EGP Learning Podcast. Blast or vlog or de whatever, depending on where you're watching or listening to us at the moment, all platforms welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Andy Foster, GP in Nottingham. I'm flying solo for today's episode. Um, Gandhi is recovering from the uh, exciting online conference that we all organised yesterday, and Gandhi played a heroic role in. Um, so I'm bringing you something interesting today. What am I talking about? Well, it's a topic that we've actually covered an awful lot of um, on EGP Learning recently, but don't be put off. Uh, things are a little bit different this morning, or today I'm filming in the morning, of course. Um, we're going to be looking at general practice, technology, and COVID-19. Um, and the reason I'm looking at this today is um, I've had the privilege of being invited to talk to uh, Bristol Medical School Medical Technology Society, and I'm going to be talking to them later today. Um, and they asked me to talk on this topic. Um, they're interested in medical technology, obviously. COVID-19 is um, the big event of the year, possibly the decade, um, and how general practice has used technology to, um, to cope through the COVID-19 challenges. And actually, whilst preparing some slides to talk around for them, I found the exercise um, a really interesting uh, opportunity to reflect on what's been happening over the last few weeks and months, because it has been really, really hectic. Um, and actually, I thought it might be interesting to just go through those slides and um, reflect on some of those things. It'll serve as a great introduction to the topic of general practice technology and COVID-19 for those who haven't um, seen or learnt much about it um, or just coming uh, new to the area. Perhaps I'm thinking medical students or people outside of the industry who are just interested in how general practices use technology to cope. Um, and for those of you who have been in it, it might serve as an interesting um opportunity for you to reflect as well and reflect along with me. So um, so here we go. Here we go. So um, those familiar with the Podblast and the vlog probably know me. I'm Dr Andy Foster. I'm a GP from uh, Pogs, a medical practice in Nottingham. Um, I wear a number of other hats as well. Um, GP Federation Director, done that for a few years. Uh, primary Care Network Clinical Director in Ball and Top Valley, which is the area where my practice is. Been involved in various ways with the RCGP Vale of Trent Faculty Board over the years. Um, and for several years, um, I've been uh, blogging and podcasting and now vlogging. Um, uh, a lot of that along with uh, Gandhi and the EGP Learning platform. So uh, that gives me an interesting perspective because COVID-19 has touched on each of these levels, really, and in different ways. And there's almost a a fascinating story to tell about what's happened due to COVID and within the context of technology at each of those levels. But I'm going to just go through a broad overview today. So useful to think about what things were like before COVID-19. It feels like it was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago, um, although it does feel and look like years ago, I think. So a lot of people, and I think medical students are included in that, perhaps didn't appreciate what general practice is um, and GPs, surgeries and organisations, generally speaking, are not directly um, managed or controlled by the NHS. General practice is actually a collection of small and medium enterprises. There are single-handed GPs, there are partnerships, groups of GPs delivering services, and there are larger um, organisations which take various forms, limited liability partnerships and limited liability companies and uh, community interest organisations, all sorts of things. And again, you could talk all day about the merits and pitfalls of those. But but general practice is a really diverse um, place. Um, but generally speaking, it's at arm's length from the NHS. And that's interesting. And there are a number of you know advantages to that. And one of them is that GP has always been a really, really innovative environment. Um, when I first moved to general practice from the hospital, uh, which was ooh, first experience was probably when I joined medical school, really, around 2000, um, I was blown away by the fact that all the medical records were actually on a computer. Uh, remember, this is 20 years ago. Um, but hospitals, even until very, very recently, um, most hospitals would have been using pen and paper for their medical notes, which just feels archaic. But general practice has had CRMS, clinical records management systems, for decades. And in fact, um, some of uh, the big names in the world, like Emis Health and System One, um, who are clinical records management systems, you know, started life in general practice up in up in Leeds um, and you know came from GPs trying to solve problems um, also there are examples in the more recent past of GPs starting companies to deliver video 
consultations and electronic triage systems and all sorts of things. So it's a really, really innovative environment. And I think a lot of that is born of the fact that it is at arm's length from general practice and that people can have a little bit more freedom to innovate. So if you're a student out there and you're interested in that sort of activity and doing that sort of thing in the future, then general practice is a good um, career to consider. Um, and also, so general practice is also diverse. So you've got all of these small and medium-sized organisations delivering care. And some of them will be very traditional, a bit like the... Um, the, the picture on the left here, not sure anybody uses um, manual blood pressure cuffs um, as a first line anymore, but, but pretty traditional like that. And, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you've perhaps got companies um, like Babylon Health, who um, you know are a general practice organisation and linked with practices in, uh, in London, but they really um, push and embrace the use of um, AI chat triage and video consultations, um, and all sorts of, of other innovative things. Um, in some ways, people consider them a bit of a controversial company because they're, um, they're what's the word, disruptors. So uh, they're perhaps disrupting some of the traditional models of general practice, but, um, but that's healthy to a certain extent. But anyway, really diverse. Um, and that's good because um, people have the freedom to experiment at the fringes but then you've got a whole bulk of people sort of following up and adopting either what works and, and, and not adopting what doesn't. So that was a situation before COVID-19. Um, and then COVID-19 hit. So this uh, is a slide that I presented to uh, my team at the practice on the 16th of March and also made available to Ball and Top Valley Primary Care Network for them to use if they wanted to. Um, one of my members of staff reflected uh, the other day and said, oh, Dr. Foster, do you remember sort of that first day when we put things in place for um, the coronavirus pandemic um, and we all went in the room and you showed us those slides and you looked really really scared Dr Foster <laughs> um, you know do you remember that I said yes I do remember that um, so this is one of the this is the main slide that I slowly showed in that presentation and I was scared because I'd spent the weekend having conversations with people a little bit further up in the system than me who um, had spent some time with um, some of the local and more national strategic decisions that were being made around that preceding weekend. It was the weekend when an influential study for Imperial College London um, came out um, and actually sort of raised alarm bells about the capacity of the system to deal with the surge and um, inspired a bit of a change, uh, prompt change in direction from the government. So uh, for those not familiar, um, the main focus of dealing with with this pandemic, or at least at the beginning, was to make sure that we could cope with um, that the that the healthcare system had the capacity to cope with the number of cases you might be expected to. Um, the predictions that at that point were predicting actually quite a, a big dramatic um, spike in cases, uh, with a proportion of people known to need ventilation in hospital, um, and only with a with a finite number of ventilators. And actually, the 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 main alarm was around the um, prediction that we just wouldn't have anywhere near enough ventilators to ventilate people if the virus continued to multiply and spread at the rate it, it did. There's a few factors here. So there's how quickly um, it rises, how high the peak is, and where that healthcare system capacity line is. And they're all movable, really. Uh, and what we were talking about was shifting the peak to the right, make it shallower and last longer. Same area under those curves, but in one of the curves... Um, healthcare system capacity is exceeded in one, it isn't. Um, so we were emphasising to the staff that we want to delay the curve, shift it to the right, and that means reducing contact between people. So that's reducing contact between individuals out there in the um, environment, in the economy. So people were going to be asked to lock down and stay at home and avoid contact with other people to stop the spread of the virus, but also to reduce contact with us at the surgery because the surgery is actually a fairly high-risk environment for picking up um, illnesses, uh, particularly at times of pan pandemic and with something that's fairly easily spread like COVID-19. So people were going to, the emphasis was to try and keep people at arm's length and the surgeon only see people when absolutely necessary. Also an emphasis on protecting each other. Um, staff were um, scared by how scared I looked, I think, that morning and then, you know, um, became more familiar with the actual challenge in the coming days and weeks. Um, but um, it was important to look after staff so that we could keep that healthcare system capacity line um, as high as possible.
because that's not just a fixed line. You know, once healthcare staff start to become ill and start to not be able to be at work doing their job, that line drops and that means more of those cases lay above that line. So it's really important that staff look after each other, use their PPE appropriately, um, you know, wash hands, all, you know, all of these very simple measures just to try and keep people healthy uh, in the workplace and also avoid getting too stressed and, and all of those things, uh, but conserve PPE. So uh, PPE became a lot more controversial after this date, actually, but we were anticipating that the supplies of personal protective equipment might be challenged. So we, from the outset, were quite careful about our usage within the practice. So, so that was the situation. Um, thinking about further how the impact of that translates to general practice. Um, so um, actually, first of all, a special mention to the film Contagion, uh, which was in the top spots on Netflix for many, many weeks during those uh, initial stages of the pandemic. Absolutely awesome film. Um, quite gritty, uh, made with the World Health Organization uh, pandemic playbook in hand. So they, they talk about all sorts of things. They have debates about closing the school, social distancing, R numbers, um, contact tra tracing, containment, um, keeping healthcare capacity up, even um, misinformation and the spread of fake uh, news and medical information on social media. It, it, it's, an, it's an amazing film. Um, so I really recommend people go out and watch that. Um, but yeah, for this first few weeks, I, I felt a little bit like I was in Contagion, actually, and driving around on the empty roads and actually got my, my fishing cap out. Uh, and you know, it felt like I was in a bit of a movie um, driving around. So in some ways, it was exciting, but also tragic consequence, of course, for a lot of, a lot of people. So impact on general practice. So everyone was, was, was asked to move to a total triage system, so reducing the number of contacts with people in practice. So um, total triage generally meant that nobody was allowed to turn up unannounced um, at the general practice surgery that people should ring up beforehand. And generally speaking, practice were doing telephone triage. They were converting their face-to-face -face appointments into telephone triage. So patients would contact the practice. They'd be contacted by someone from the practice, usually and often a clinician who would then decide how and where to deal with them. Um, it was important that practices, or is important, protect staff, um, making sure that the PPE is uh, is available and that it's being used correctly and responsibly and that we also don't run out as well as using it um, and conducting staff risk assessments and again this became more important later on as links to um, certain demographics and characteristics became more obvious like the BAME community. Um, we were asked to um, flow patients um, uh, differently um, in terms of hot and cold patients and also shielded patients as well and uh, keep these patients apart and treat them separately. Um, and in Nottingham, uh, we um, set up uh, regional uh, respiratory assessment centres called CMCs, uh, clinical management centres, for our um, hot suspected COVID patients, uh, which took a lot of work, and that's something general practice had to do. Um, and we were asked to plan for high numbers of unwell respiratory cases, up to 4% of our population in a week, and that's hundreds of hundreds of people that, that need for the average practice that might need assessment. So getting those hot sites uh, was really, really important. Um, the impact on care homes evolved, I think, in a different way to, to the way people thought. Um, but we were encouraged to have end-of-life conversations in care homes. I remember doing a few ward rounds, um, visiting patients in care homes, also going room to room, having making sure end-of-life plans are in place, um, which um, is really important. And actually, for a lot of those patients, it would have been good to have those conversations even earlier. Um, but it's interesting and demoralising. And when you're ringing um, families to get their input, um, they also knew what was going on and that we were in care homes and uh, putting these end of life plans in place and uh, knowing why we were doing it. So that was an, an interesting time. And uh, I learned a new phrase, degrade gracefully. So as primary care networks, we were asked to produce plans that would enable services to degrade gracefully. So they're almost planning for the for the end of the world, it felt like. Uh, you know, what would happen if you lost 50, 70 percent of your workforce? Um, how would you collapse um, the general practice sites in your area down to you know, one last stand site at the end? How would you um, get access to people's medical records at that one site? How would you coordinate the staff that were unwell but working from home, the staff 
that were able to work but had a closed site, would they come to one central hub? So we were asked to produce plans to degrade gracefully. And even beyond the primary care networks, um, I remember um, hearing about where the military field hospital was planned to be built and, you know, what the sort of last stand um, uh, measures would be. So quite interesting conversations. So, but necessity is the mother invention. So where does this come back to technology? Um, and actually looking at, uh, back to the future. So looking at where we are now compared to a few months ago, you know, people say, oh gosh, it feels like COVID-19 has pulled us several years into the future. And I've put five here, but it could easily be 10. Just looking back at, at how things changed over the previous five years or how little they changed over the previous five years. I'm not sure another five years would have got us to where we are now. So there's been a lot of innovation and deployment of, of technology that was almost waiting in the in the wings. Um, this other picture here that I've got, for and for those of you who can't see the picture, uh, it's a dam bursting and somebody cutting some red tape. Um, it almost feels like there was a lot of innovation and things that might help general practice under normal circumstances that was sort of waiting and waiting for information governance decisions and um, approval and people had various concerns about how they would impact themselves and their workload and patients and stakeholders um, and things were really really slow but it feels like things really really sped up because there was a need for some of these things because we just weren't able to see patients face to face and we needed to improve the safety of our assessments um, and it was really interesting that there was perhaps some pockets of of of, of resistance but because GPs and primary care networks and people could now talk to each other on WhatsApp about what was happening in their area, what was allowed in their area. People were able to, uh, and also learn what was possible from different technology providers. People were able to share all of that and put pressure on their local system and say, well, if this is available down in London, why isn't it available here? Uh, and no, no, why not? Is, is that a good enough explanation to deny patients you know, access to video consultations in here when it's available in other parts of the country and really can improve um, the safety of remote assessments at this point in time. Why not? And interestingly, a lot of the problems um, evaporated and things moved forward really, really uh, quickly. And that was great. So I think for medical students watching, they're probably expecting me to talk a lot about things like video consultation and things that feel very technological and innovative. And... Um, those sorts of things have been really important um, in the response. Um, it's interesting that, and I think because of the way that general practice is a collection of small companies that can make their own procurement decisions, um, it encourages an ecosystem of um, smaller companies that are smaller than perhaps those that generally provide technology to the hospital and secondary care environment. And they can be quite innovative. So, um, those companies were really important and they sort of set the pace of change. So if the, some of the smaller companies brought things like video consultation um, out in a way that was really accessible and other bigger companies actually had to accelerate their, their plans and have brought things forwards that perhaps were waiting in the wings as well. Um, NHS X, NHS Digital, uh, local and national IT leaders, GP leaders have been really important actually in releasing this technology i think in part due to pressure from grassroots um but also i think they were just empowered and enabled by the situation to make things happen um as i mentioned before the uh, individual gps and managers and networks were all networked together large part by whatsapp so that's a really important technology in all of this and more on whatsapp later they were able to um, apply the right pressure in the right places and lobby for this technology to come forward. That was really good. So special mention to um, to one company. Um, there's been many companies, many heroes throughout all of this, but AccuRx were really good. So they started as a really small niche company. And I think how they got on everybody's radar was by being really, really responsive with new features and new ways of um, doing things. Um, and by how they made video consultation really easy to roll out. So I was involved in thinking about video consultations, and, and I was actually designing a pilot with the Federation before COVID-19, and we were thinking, okay, what's the right app to use? How do, we, how do we prepare patients for a video consultation? They'll have to 
download the app beforehand and be ready you know at the time and actually the way AccuRx do video consultations and the way a lot of other providers do now is really different is, is really is different and I thought oh goodness me what a great way to do it why why didn't anyone think of that before so actually uh, the way it, it works best is actually if you're transitioning from a telephone consultation to a video consultation and what you do is the clinicians you say right I think there's value in making this audio telephone encounter into a video encounter so that I can see you see your child see how you're moving see how you're breathing look at your skin um, you know get a lot richer information um, to make an assessment as to what's happening and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to send you a, a text message you don't even have to hang up the call you can stay on the line look at that text message in there there's a link click on that link a browser window will open but we can continue to talk through this and uh, just just give it the relevant positions yeah I'm here on the phone I'm saying it's okay let the browser use your camera no you don't need to download an app or do anything else um, and um, AccuRx just just opens in a browser and you can see the patient the patient can see you 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 just copy the link from it into your own browser as well um, and you can instantly see and continue your consultation as a video consultation and it was really really awesome and it requires zero onboarding of patients before it happens so you can just go for it like that so it's so really really good and it, it's got um, AccuRx uh, you know, a lot of traction um, one of these pictures here is um, is just what it looks like on the screen of a smartphone um, the other one is a video produced by it's either one done by me or Gandhi I'm not sure um, about how to use AccuRx um, and actually the other Sort of layer of people involved are those people who um, help other people understand and spread the information across these networks. I think that's where you know Gandhi in particular and myself to a lesser extent um, have been helpful, hopefully, to the community in producing these videos and also how tos that people can text to uh, patients so that they can click on their phone, see a video about how to do a video consultation if they're not sure. You know, all of these things are really useful. But special mention to AccuRx. So, just thinking more about remote consultations um, and how I think a lot of practices have actually implemented this um, so I think that and there'll be all sorts of ways of doing it because there's a lot of variety in general practice but I think a general model that's emerged is we move to total telephone triage so the first contact is normally on the telephone um, I've put e-consultation in brackets here because uh, I know of some practices although they're not not, not numerically the majority in our area who have taken the opportunity to go live with or they went live with previously electronic consultation models so just a word about that first because that might happen before the initial telephone consultation and I think there's a lot of scope for this to be quite impactful in the future so prior to um, having a live contact with the practice a patient either going to the website or trying to book an appointment through the NHS app or another channel is advised to um, do a pre-consultation assessment essentially filling an online form which often has um, a branching question structure so if you say what's wrong so i've got a headache it's okay it'll, then it'll ask you questions that are specifically relevant to headache and also some safety netting questions so that it can you know if you happen to have chest pain it can advise you that a and e might be the best place for you um, so with safety measures built in um, but this produces a pre-taken history about what's happened that is then communicated to the practice and that's often actually triaged by a member of staff who then decides which work stream that's best to go into it might be something that just needs a, a you know a prescription it's very clear it just needs a prescription so it can it can be authorized and go to a prescription team or yeah, best suited to a telephone consultation or actually no we need to see that person or no not suitable needs to go somewhere else um, and I think that's going to be really impactful in the future particularly if artificial intelligence can truly start to have an impact um, on um, making and taking and streamlining some of those decisions but I think the majority of practices probably haven't gone in that direction yet so first con first contact is likely to be the telephone um, with a uh, telephone triage with a clinician um, the way we do it is um, we actually say right, that's the starting point no one goes straight for a video consultation starting point telephone consultation and then the clinician guides the patient through the interaction and um, you know, it's a crisis time might be short we need to be most impactful and safe so if there's value in escalating that to a video consultation to get more information the clinician will suggest that to the patient 
Um, let's not forget other slightly lower tech things that can help with remote consultation. So actually, um, you often get a better image if you ask the patient to just say, oh, I'm on the phone to you. Take a photo of this skin rash. Um, I'll tell you how to get some really good good quality photos. Press, press the screen to get the focus right. Maybe get someone to help you take it um, and email that to the practice. Or here's a, a link to, to, to SMS that to the practice and, and I'll review that and we can continue the conversation with those images and maybe we, we don't need to see you. Um, a lot of practices and networks did work getting equipment to patients so that they could still be assessed outside of the surgery. So SATS monitors, uh, oxygen saturation was actually a really important metric in deciding who was unwell with COVID-19 uh, or likely to be unwell and who was likely to be uh, less unwell and more suitable for self-management at home and self-isolation. So actually a lot of primary care networks would bus these out to patients, to their homes to use. Uh, more commonly, uh, they could purchase some and, and they could be in care homes so the care home staff could use them. You know, very, very simple equipment. And that can really enhance the quality of a telephone or uh, video assessment. And I've put just the beginning because I think, okay, it starts with SATS probes. Um, other people are already experimenting with all sorts of other remote physical assessment. But I think that's something people are going to get a lot more excited about post-COVID. Um, and the important thing here is that the the for us the, the clinician is um, actually guiding the patient through. So less of a patient choice driven agenda, which I think was the direction we were heading in with video consultations before COVID. In any case, if a face to face assessment is required, we can do that in the surgery. You know, people shouldn't. I think a lot of people thought that general practice was closed, but but we weren't. We were doing a hell of a lot of telephone assessments, um, still seeing patients face to face wearing appropriate protective equipment. And those suspected COVID-19 cases were being seen in special respiratory assessment units um, in Nottingham staffed by by GPs from their normal practices. Um, so face to face assessment definitely has a part and definitely continued. The yeah, so the assessment is is not the end, though. And actually, there are um, additional uh, tools which help after the consultation as well. Um, so uh, and again, some of these are fairly simple, but we had a big push to actually get people on to uh, the last people remaining who weren't having electronic prescriptions. Yes, nominate a pharmacy. Let's get that going because we don't want you coming into surgery to pick up a prescription. So it was a good opportunity to do that. Um, we could email out or text message out um, sick notes and other documents. And you know, that's probably been possible for years, but it's something that we weren't doing until COVID gave us a reason to. And I don't think we'll go back afterwards. And also texting out links to information. I texted out links to a lot of the public health information an awful lot when talking to patients. Homeworking. So... This was something that became big and I think it's going to continue to be a really useful tool post COVID. So initially enabling remote and home working for staff was about keeping, pe keeping people in the game. Uh, we had a lot of staff who were actually well or only mildly unwell and self-isolating because they had COVID-19 symptoms or their child or their partner um, had um, COVID-19 symptoms, but they could still actually work remotely they were still perfectly fit they just couldn't physically be in the building and it was possible uh, because we were remotely assessing patients to really slot them into the workflow and have them doing full telephone triage video consultation type um, activity from home um, uh, supporting those people in the surgery of course if they need a face-to-face -face appointment they'll have to book them with someone who's physically in the surgery or one of the um, respiratory assessment units uh, but that actually worked really, really well. There were some teething problems. We perhaps didn't have as many laptops or equipment as we would want. And I remember bussing them around um, between different people uh, who were self, uh, self-isolating. And that was interesting. Um, we'll hopefully have more uh, equipment in the future. There was some um, capacity squeeze on um, NHS IT networks initially. Um, the, the IT people seem to sort that out pretty promptly, actually. So hats off to them. You also got to think about which telephone people are using. Are they going to disguise their telephone number? Uh, you know, withhold caller number, make sure people are doing things like that. Um, and the other thing that was important with home workers was to keep them connected and supported by the team. Um, it can be quite isolating um, working from home. So we got people into our uh, daily morning meeting uh, 
uh, via WhatsApp video or Zoom to keep people connected. And not only supporting people, not only supported by the team, but also supporting the team, because often these are, are key influential members of staff who might have a role supporting the other team if they were there and they're not. So it's important that you don't lose that effect when people are working from home. Um, in the future, I think we'll we'll stick with probably a lot of home working. It's a really interesting tool, enables a lot of flexibility um, and potentially unlocking bits of the workforce that don't that perhaps don't currently contribute as much as they could um, or you know, might want to contribute more and be paid for it. So I'm, I'm thinking about people with, um, you know, at times when they have childcare um, responsibilities, uh, enabling them to continue to contribute whilst at home, you know, in partial supervision of children while doing telephone consultation. All of these things become much more possible. Also, maybe conquering some of the, the geographical disparities in GP coverage. There are some areas where it's difficult to get GPs to work and actually maybe not as many of people actually need to be physically there for them to work in those communities. Um, and also, um, there's the important issue of estates and unlocking space in surgeries. A lot of surgeries run out of rooms as their practice lists increase as people need to consult more. Uh, people are running out of rooms looking to build more rooms. And um, actually, if some people can work not from a clinical room, from a different room in the surgery or from their own home, uh, that's really helpful to uh, unlock space in the estates of surgeries. Another layer. So the practice is one layer, but there's there's multiple layers to this onion that is um, that is the primary care response. So um, coordination, let's think about the practice first. So this is where technology can have a real role, but it's important not to forget the uh, existing tried and tested technology. New technology isn't always the best. Um, so thinking about staff communication and organising staff. So it's really important to communicate what and why that's not really a technology thing but don't forget that um, if you're dealing with change um, because you've got to keep staff motivated and potentially for the long run um, just put at the bottom actually just to remind me staff welfare safety and morale and pasting uh, and pacing and i think all of those communication is relevant and particularly the last two just making people aware that this might be a marathon this might go on for 12 18 24 months so people need to make sure that they don't burn themselves out in the first three months. Um, so communicating what and why are really important. Um, we still had socially distanced physical meetings because they're really helpful and you get a lot more from that, I think, than, than what you can get on some of the online meeting platforms. Moving towards technology, so we already had a good intranet system that spanned across um, all of the city practices in Nottingham, actually. That was a great way of disseminating uh, large amounts of frequently changing information. So that was really, really important. And practices use that internally for their own teams as well. Uh, WhatsApp really came into its own. I think those practices or groups that didn't have a WhatsApp group ended up with one by the end of it. Um, really good for, for organization. Um, but also that general practice WhatsApp group is really great for people just supporting one another. Um, and for those who are off self-isolating or sick for connecting in with the team, that was really, really important um don't forget physical things though like posters actually putting stuff up on walls um helps remind people of things and key points and why things are happening um so notice boards posters really important um and also you know it could have been one of those moments where we said all oh, right what a great time to move our project management to asana or slack let's um, embrace these platforms and plan our and coordinate our COVID response using those. Uh, not always um, the right time to introduce new technologies. And actually, we used a lot of paper, stuck to the wall, lists, where are the computers, who's off sick, when are they coming back, just having all of that information you know, across all the walls in the manager's office was really helpful to us. Um, also important for practices is communicating with patients because there's a lot of change, or there was a lot of change going on in terms of how they accessed primary care um, and i think it's important to think about all of your possible communication channels so technology is really important so it's important actually practice websites get a lot of traffic i look at the the traffic that comes through our website and it's you know 100 plus often you know many times that per day so practice websites are really well used so getting the information right on the practice website is really important and you have a lot of freedom you can use as much space as you want you can use video you 
you can use pictures, you can use all sorts of things. Um, Twitter and Facebook, where those are available to practices, um, I think could be really, really helpful, but don't underestimate the website. Um, and don't forget that you can text patients. I know most surgeries were doing this, but um, texting patients about the changes to service and remember things like the telephone answer message. Um, that's a great way to get information to people who want your service now. You know, very, very targeted and useful. And, you know, remember there's posters and you can put them up not just in your surgery, but also, you know, outside the local library, although they were closed pretty quickly. But other areas can help um, can help you communicate with your patients. The tier above practices is the wider system. So I'm just going to explain these three letter abbreviations for the for the benefit of those not as familiar with the system who might be listening or watching primary care networks. Those are new organisations and their um, uh, collections of uh, local practice in the community working together, population size, probably around 50,000 patients. ICPs are integrated care partnerships. They're sort of the next level up, really. Not all levels have ICPs. Some levels just go straight to ICSs. But ICPs are probably looking at populations of around several hundred thousand, really. And in Nottingham, our ICP would have around 360,000 people covering the city. Um, so that's those practices. And also the city council, other organisations that might be providing health and social care. Um, they're trying to bring all of those people together gather and coordinate their activities and the ICS really is the next level up um, and in Nottingham that's sort of the three ICPs looking after a population of around a million plus I think I've got that right it might even be bigger than that even so what challenges does the system have right well there's a lot of information to get to people and it changes often um, you might have new services to develop like hot respiratory assessment sites but everyone who would be involved in the development is actually um, working at their own practice and shouldn't be congregating together in meetings. So there's a challenge there. Um, you need to coordinate multiple sites and services while socially distancing. Um, a new problem, I think, which was interesting was, was disinformation. So that exists in you know, general social media, but also uh, little rumours can start in WhatsApp groups um, online and, you know, little you know, groups can develop that are disgruntled and it's not always about the right things and it's not always helpful. So the system needs to deal with that, um, which is an interesting challenge, I think. Um, and also the danger is because we're a collection of all sorts of small, different organisations that different people do different things. And you know, one surgery is, is practically closed completely. Another surgery isn't really res respecting social distance or using the PPE correctly. Uh, so you've got to try and, try and keep everyone on the same page. And, and reduce the variation across services. So lots of challenges. How did the system respond using technology? Well, actually, the system intranet um, can feel a bit old-fashioned now, but that was really, really helpful. There was a single page that was updated um, with all the new coronavirus information. Old information was removed. That was the place that you could trust for local and national information. That was really, really helpful. Some of our local leaders um, did blogs. It's great to get information in different ways to explain some of the changes and also keep morale up, and that was really appreciated. Um, there was no, a lot of video meetings. So as someone wearing a few hats within the system at the Federation and in a primary care network, gosh, have I been in a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, and they're really good for some things, and they're not so good for others. Um and there was a lot of enthusiasm at first, but I think there's a lot of fatigue, but they were really good. And also hats off to some of the national primary care leaders who um, have organized um, large scale webinars um, and Zoom meetings um, at a national scale to get information out. So Nikki Kanani, um, NHS England Director of Primary Care, been really, really, really active on social media um, and in um, doing webinars, That's really, really appreciated and has been really helped the response. We talked about WhatsApp groups. So again, can always have too much of a good thing. A uh, great way for spreading information, for getting momentum behind change, for supporting each other. Um, but in the end, you've got to mute some of those groups because uh, there can be too much of a good thing. Um, th in the midst of all this, um, the NHS signed up to MS Teams, um, which does a lot of what WhatsApp does, does a lot of what Zoom does um, in a platform that is secure for 
discussion around patient identifiable information. So I think that's going to be really important going forwards. A lot of teams are beginning to use that. Um, so yeah, lots of technology. Um, coming towards the end of the presentation now, but just this slide says the end of the beginning, the four waves. And it's just to highlight that whilst a lot's happened and it feels like things are beginning to calm down, we're perhaps just at the end of this wave one, first wave, uh, the immediate um, surge in cases and morbidity associated directly with COVID-19. And that'll subside, but there's, they, they say there are three more waves coming. Um, you know, there's a second wave of people who actually perhaps didn't present with their heart attack, their stroke, their diabetes. Um, they uh, they didn't present with their um, uh, you know, with their other conditions, and we're going to have to deal with that, um, or for the management of their chronic disease, and that's going to cause you know a, a backlog of work and a backlog of. Um, morbidity that may not have been there if people presented earlier and that's going to be a big issue um that's really the second and third wave the second wave actually that's the third wave the second wave was was complication of covid19 and it's 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 unclear what that's going to look like but it will exist and we're seeing a lot of people actually with with slow recovery from covid19 who still have symptoms weeks and months later so it will be interesting to see how things develop for that cohort of people and then, of course, there's a fourth wave because this isn't just affecting uh, people's physical health now. There's, have, there's an effect of the lockdown on mental health. There will be effects of job losses and economic hardship coming um, on people's social situation and their mental health. And that's only just beginning or it hasn't even begun. And we need to think about how we're going to address that and potentially how we'll use technology to address it. So there's still lots of questions to ask as we move forward into the future. So just pulling things together into a summary, really, um, and these lists are not comprehensive, but just thinking about what's what are some of the negatives of this whole thing, aside from loss of life and suffering and economic hardship, but just in terms of the changes, um, and then looking at some of the good things. So the bad, this list almost writes itself, really, but we don't know what's happening with the delayed presentation of disease, COVID complications and people who put off coming to the GP or going to A&E or put off their hospital appointments. Um, that's bad and we're going to have to deal with it and it's going to be difficult. Um, we're not quite sure how much increased clinical risk we've been accepting through consulting with people remotely in the way that we have because whilst it's great that we push through these innovations, actually a lot of it is untested and this is the big test. Um, and will we find that actually when we were assessing remotely on the telephone because we had to, when we were using video consultations because we have to, did we miss things? You know, Have we caused some problems there that we will need to put right? So there's a big question mark on the clinical risk and I think that's obviously a negative. Um, staff have delayed their holidays. I've delayed some holidays. I feel fatigued. Staff feel fatigued. So we need to catch that up at some point before the next wave of whatever hits us. Um, Zoom has been an interesting experience. Uh, it's it's great in some ways and you get a more structured meeting and you can have a meeting where circumstances would have meant you wouldn't have been able to have one ordinarily. But it's not very good for maintaining those sort of relationships between people and it's hard to read people on video. So actually, I think whilst you're leaning into and onto a lot of relationships because it's a stressful crisis situation, those um, things that you do to maintain the health of those relationships or read people correctly and not annoy people are a lot harder. So I think it puts friction on relationships. It also reduces the threshold at which a meeting takes place. So if everyone has to drive to a location and take the afternoon off work to go to a meeting, you've got to have a pretty good reason to have a meeting. Um, if people can just hop in for an hour in the middle of their telephone clinic, which is, is easy to profile around meetings, then people are more likely to have that meeting doesn't mean they should have had that meeting. So I think we're going to have to call a lot of these Zoom meetings going forwards. Information overload, gosh, so much WhatsApp, so much um, social media, so many updates. Goodness me, I can't cope if it carries on like this. And hopefully life won't. Um, remote working, similar really, blurs the lines between work and home um, and 
Uh, I found myself replying to WhatsApps in the middle of the night throughout this and emails, and that is not healthy, and that needs to stop. Um, next one's interesting. I think there's been an adoption of a command and control approach to a lot of activity, which would have been unheard of in general practice in the past. They used to say it was like herding cats, getting G GP surgeries to do anything. Um, and actually, the centre's done a pretty good job of getting a coordinated response. Um, and I wonder if the centre will seek to keep some of that power and whether that will be really resisted and that might be a tension going forwards. Um, and of course, the reduced patient contact. I mean, do I did I go to medical school and qualify as a GP because I just wanted to sit in a call centre all day? I don't know. Will there be? I'm not sure. It's felt effective. But will there be an impact on how people feel about their work and how patients feel about their GPs because of the reduced patient contact. Gosh, that was a long, bad list, wasn't it? What's the good? So it's been really nice to experience a really agile, energetic, innovative um, and quicker um, attitude towards progress. I think some of the people that I used to think stood in the way of progress to a certain extent seem to have had a more can-do attitude. Um, I'm thinking of sort of you know, information governance type uh, people. It's been really interesting to see how, how they've adapted and been more enabling. And it'd be nice to keep some of that, although they also need to tell us when we're doing things which are not appropriate from an information governance and IT security perspective as well. That is vitally important. Um, it's been great to see the spread of ideas and good practice and um, videos and assessment tools and knowledge across the networks that have been rapidly put together of healthcare professionals. I'm thinking largely of WhatsApp groups, really. Um, and I think they're going to stay, be really helpful to keep some of those. Um, it's that ecosystem of companies that have really stepped up to create the digital tools and, and help us use them. Uh, has been fantastic, actually, and I hope that we see more of those companies and more like them in the future. An interesting thing that's happened, and I think this hasn't played out completely yet, um, but for a period of time, there seemed to be more respect for expert opinion and that actually the scientists were useful in terms of forming government policy. And also, it feels like GPs and other healthcare professionals and allied health professionals and our nurses and AMPs and everybody has been trusted a little bit more to guide the patients through the uh, clinical journey. And we've been trusted to know when it's appropriate and it's going to be helpful and safe and be efficient on resources to use a video appointment or to send an image or to come to the surgery or to do a home visit or to not do those things. That's been empowering. I think it's, it's probably good for the system and good for the patients in the long run. You have to get the balance right and patient choice is really important but it's been nice to see the pendulum swing back in the direction of specialists and, and experts a little bit. I think that's a positive thing. Um, not mentioned this so far, but a lot of GP surgeries have been and felt less busy and have been feeling that the new ways that they're dealing with patients, telephone triage, for example, allows them to manage their demand and profile um, how their work is done throughout the day in a way that makes things not worse for patients, maybe better, but makes the workload and workflows easier for clinicians to tolerate and have a better working day. And that's a positive. Be interesting to see how, if I put so far question mark, because it'd be interesting to see if that does actually continue. Um, and finally, remote working. We've talked about this before, but I think there's the potential for it to really um, unlock physical space in practice by moving some activities out of clinical rooms uh, and to unlock um, areas and sectors of the workforce and enable people to work more flexibly at times when they perhaps wouldn't previously have been able to uh, do clinical work. And I think that can only be a good thing. So hopefully that was an interesting opportunity. I found it an interesting opportunity to reflect on the last few months. Hopefully you guys enjoyed reflecting with me. And just for those medical students out there and who will be uh, listening to me later today, just wondering, yeah, what what do you what do you think about the change? I'm wondering if you might have felt found it quite underwhelming and been in expecting something more fantastic and futuristic and technological, um, but 
but believe me, we've moved forwards multiple years, possibly a decade. Um, I wonder, medical students, is this the sort of environment that you want to work in? There's going to be less patient contact, potentially. Is that what you signed up for at medical school? Or don't you mind that? And, you know, you're, you're out there to embrace change and so forth. And my final question to the medical students would be, um, what of this would you like to keep? What else have you seen elsewhere that you'd like to add? What, what future of general practice would you like to see, would you like to build? I think these are all really interesting questions. And we try and answer those questions on EGP Learning, available on YouTube. There's a website, egplearning.co.uk. Hope I got that right. Use Google if not. Um, and connect with myself on Twitter, Dr. A.W. Foster and Gandhi, Dr. Gandalf52. Um, connect and keep in touch. And this podcast is available as a vlog on YouTube and on all good podcasting platforms. Please uh, review, leave a rating. It really helps with the metrics. Um, and it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Sorry if I rambled on a bit, but I've really enjoyed uh, reminiscing and so looking forward to doing the same thing with the medical students later today. So um, keep EGP learning and we'll catch you next time. Bye bye.